Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to discuss rendering and finishing eyes. So rendering and finishing is something that we all want to work on. We all want to have better polished and finished and gorgeous looking drawings and paintings, of course, especially when we do our portraits. And of course, we all know the number one thing we have to make look good is the eyes, of course. And before we begin, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to my free Insiders Club. Insiders Club members get first access to these weekly live streams. And you also get access to other live events. And you get discounts on courses and programs, along with access to free lessons and other free content available only to subscribers. So all you have to do is go to www drawwithchris.com and there you can enter your email and you'll be good to go. So we're going to talk about focus really deeply on rendering the eye, finishing the eye. Finishing is really the most important thing we're going to discuss today. You know, how to get that last, last 10, 5, 1% to make your eyes look professional, look the highest quality possible, look finished, look clear very attractive, very beautiful. So we'll talk about that today. First, we'll begin with defining what is finished. What is finished? What is rendered? There's um, no real clear definition of it. For me, finish just means clarity and quality, meaning is the eye clear, clearly drawn, clear shapes, excellent position, those kind of things. Is it clear? Where are the eyes looking? Where are the models looking? Is it clear the size, the shape, the color, those kind of things? And also the quality. Does the marks and lines look good? The paint strokes look good? Are the values correct? Are the edges correct? Is the level of detail, the amount of rendering and finishing and polishing and attention, is that correct? That's what we're going to start with as well, because that's really important. How do you know when the eye is finished? What does that mean? So here we have some examples of, uh, and this is from a tweet here by this young man, and um, so wonderful tweet. I barely use Twitter. And when I was on there just by accident, this tweet came up, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful tweet that shows you three great masters or experts and how they handle eyes. And as we can see, they're clearly <laughs> all quite different. Now, technically, they're all three of these eyes are finished. They're finished. They're all on finished works of art. On the left by Dean Cornwell, upper right Rubens, on the bottom by Marie Cassatt, French impressionist. And you could see, um, of course, the position of the model's face is different. So the shape of the eye and the position of the eye is different. Also on the lower right, the eyelid is covering. A lot of the eye itself looks like the model is looking down at something. So, of course, there's a lot less work <laughs> involved there, a lot less stuff for us to manage there. But that is also a finished eye. So, as you can see, really finish in a lot of ways depends on many things. And one thing it depends on is obviously the position and obviously the level of detail and the level of care, detail, and attention that the eye needs. So obviously, we don't see the full painting. So that's very important too on the Dean Cornwell. We don't see the full painting, but most likely this man's eye was not that important relative to the full painting. And you can even see that this man's head is not as polished even as just say the bridge of the nose of the Rubens on the right. You can see much more care and rendering and detail and shapes went over to the Rubens here on, on the upper right. But then when we get to the Cornwall, you can see even the face, not so much, mostly suggested. And we'll talk about that as well. And you can see that because relative to everything around it, and most likely because relative to the painting, the eye didn't need that much attention. So in this case, just a brilliant shape, some edge control, and some beautiful value control was all you needed to make a quote unquote finished eye. And obviously on the Marie Cassatt here, you can see it's mostly eyelid. So yes, <laughs> obviously it's much easier, less work for us as artists to quote unquote finish that eye. But again, just because it's mostly eyelid 
doesn't mean that it's not expertly crafted, expertly positioned, correctly positioned, expert value control. Nice, beautiful colors as well. And we'll talk about color as well. But you can see how um, that is a finish as well. And here we'll look at some Sargent, the great uh, John Sargent, arguably the greatest portrait artist to ever live. And three examples of this work. These three examples really show you um, the idea of suggestion. Suggestion versus telling. There's a saying that I really like. It's the beginner tells, the master suggests. The beginner tells, the master suggests. Meaning the beginner will explain and draw the eye and each eyelash and go crazy with detail. But the expert can just put one, two, three strokes, ship, 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 and make the eye look 100 times better than the beginner eye, which took 100 times longer, which has 100 times more marks. Why? Because that is suggestion. These three examples you can see on the left here, it's much more of an orthodox portrait of a much more subject matter, most likely looks like an important military figure or perhaps a politician. So this was probably a, someone who commissioned the artist who was quite a prominent and important person. So this needed, and its purpose was, you know, perhaps to hang in a government building or perhaps to hang in a, an important public space or even perhaps to hang in this person's home. And he may be a very important, prominent person, looks, looks like it. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, uh, forgive me, I didn't look up the history. But the subject matter demanded more attention to detail. And this one clearly, I mean, he's most likely wearing a, you know, beautiful clothing. We can see collar and tie. But the purpose of this painting wasn't to be, oh, I need to paint a portrait of an important person that paid me thousands and thousands of dollars. No, this is, um, you know, perhaps a friend. It's a much more casual setting. That's what I meant. <laughs> Excuse me. It's more formal. That's, that's the word I'm looking for. More formal, more casual. So you can see less attention to detail in the eyes. And then this one, clearly, clearly more, much more of a casual painting. And if you look at the eyes, much, much, much less attention to detail, but still, quote unquote, finished. And when we look up close, this is basically the scale of finish. On the left, you have much more explained, more rendered, quote unquote, rendered, more detailed, more, quote unquote, polished. On the right uh, of the girl, much more suggested. So this is uh, earlier I mentioned that the beginner tells and the master suggests. Well, the master, of course, can tell because all masters start as beginners. So we all need to know how to fully render an eye if needed. But we also need to understand that the eye must also be suggested. And we're going to see another example of that. And I would say must, because in my experience, and I have spent time with some of the greatest living American painters alive today. Jeremy Lipking is one, Todorovic, Joseph Todorovic is another, Zhao Ming Wu is another. I have spent time with these great experts on portraits, and they all gave me the same advice on eyes, which is the secret to making your eyes look good is to master suggesting eyes because they all say that the less that you're able to do, the more it will look real. And if we look at the far left, you go, wow, what are you talking about, Chris? This eye is crazy, full of detail. Wow, what do you mean? This eye clearly is not. Yes, that's correct. But if we zoom, zoom in, and we'll, we'll look at another example, you'll see that this is also suggested. But because there's a little bit more refinement to the marks, then it becomes more explained. So let's take a look at that. But the key here is there is a level to whether you're going to fully explain the eye or suggest the eye. So there's, level, there's a scale to it. So you have to be aware where you want to be on the scale and what is needed for the subject also. If you're painting a very serious and formal portrait of, let's say, a high-level corporate executive that hired you, you may want to do more explanation. <laughs> if you're painting your niece, your 12-year-old niece, just for fun, you may not need to do a lot of explanation. So that's where you as an artist need awareness about your subject and a clear vision for yourself about what, what you want your 
uh, painting to look like. And here's a last example of Sargent. It's a self-portrait. You can see that we have two eyes. And this is an example of where the beginner tells and the master suggests. And it happens in the same painting, in the same exact painting. And this is a classic example of what's called the off eye or far eye and near eye that in portraits, we cannot bring both eyes to the same level because it would just look absolutely terrible. We don't bring any two things to the same level. In fact, there's a hierarchy of finishing. And that's, that's the word, there's a hierarchy, meaning if one area is at a level scale of one to 10, 10 being absolutely mostly finished, polished, finished, rendered, if one area is level 10, only that area can be level 10. Everything else has to be nine, eight, seven, six, five, as you go down or away from it, most likely. So in a portrait, most people expect the eye to be the focal point. Therefore, generally, as artists, we need to make the eye the level 10, for example, in rendering, or what's around the eye, the eyelid, the brow, the hair, of course, even the forehead, the tear duct, of course. So that needs to be level 10. And then when we get to the other eye, if we're doing, uh, if we can see the other eye, that cannot be at the same level. And same with the nose. The nose cannot be a level 10. The cheek that's next to the eye cannot be a level 10. Anything below the mouth cannot be a level 10 at all. So we need hierarchy as well. And this painting explains that brilliantly. You can see lots of suggestion, right? It's not as polished and detailed as that formal painting of the military officer, but you could see the beautiful suggestion that one or two strokes is enough to make the eye read and is enough to communicate exactly what we need and is enough to have a level of quality that makes the eye feel quote unquote real. The eyes do feel 3D, they feel fleshy, the skin feels like skin, the eye feels like different material, and even made the eye feel glossy with that beautiful, brilliant highlight and its edge control. The hair feels like hair and so on. So that's a level of quality that's there. Let's zoom in real quick. You'll see the suggestion. Wow, this is incredible. So zooming in, we can see the beautiful care put on both eyes. But I would argue there's a bit more care in the eye and light. And of course, most likely when you paint a portrait, if one eye is in light and one eye is in shadow or mostly shadow, of course, this is the logical choice. So Sargent may, gave us the logical choice here. But if you zoom in, zoom in, you can see that lots of suggestion is still there. This is basically a big blocky shape. This is one stroke. You see that red stroke right here? Shoop, 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 one stroke. That's expert genius right there. This is one stroke of this eyelid. Shoop expert genius right there. Look at this eye. One little boop, 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 possibly three strokes or less. <laughs> boop. Look at that little, little dot of highlight right here. You see that little dot of little light shape right there. That is enough to suggest so much. It is absolutely incredible. So this is, I mean, we're looking at Sargent. He's argu arguably, arguably the greatest artist to ever live. But for sure, he's the greatest Alla Prima artist to ever live. Alla Prima means like this one stroke <laughs> basically alla prima is italian for at the first so meaning fresh one stroke badass <laughs> painting style alla prima Shup. and the off eye notice he hit it in shadow okay he hit it in shadow so mostly suggested this eye is basically one light shape a big dark shape one light shape and then one two three four possibly strokes and then a little stroke of highlight for the upper eyelid so maybe five strokes but then what he does which is brilliant is he gives you this crisp edge right here shoop, right here at the upper eyelid you see the sharpness of that edge where my pointer is at pay attention to my pointer here shoop, sharpness of the eyelid and this absolutely stunning teeny tiny bright 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 highlight in fact, I'm looking at this now for the first time up close, although it's not the best and the highest quality JPEG. This color is the same as this. It's not white, but it's the brightest white on his canvas, on his palette. It's not pure white out of a two, but it's, it's damn close. 
that little dot and that little sharp edge is enough to pull the art out of shadow and tell just enough. So this is mostly suggested, mostly expert, badass, world-class, a la prima suggestion. And just one or two strokes to shoop, tell you, hey, hey, this is a realistic eye painting. Viewer, boom. Just to remind you, you're looking at a realistic painting. Boom. One, two strokes. That is what we want, my friends. But obviously, we all can't be virtuoso geniuses like Sargent. He's greatest in history, arguably. So what we can do is we can model the principle. And the principle is, hey, the shadow eye or one of the eyes needs to be less detailed. Okay, we, we, we know that. And most likely, in a situation where one eye is in shadow and one eye is in light, we will most likely need to choose the eye in light. And also this painting teaches us that even though we're rendering and quote unquote finishing the eye in light, we still need to do a lot of suggestion. We still need very simple shapes and strokes and marks. We cannot overdo or overtell the story. We still need to think like Sargent, think like an expert, and still need to do a lot of suggestion. And I will demonstrate that now. Okay, before we begin our demo, I want to talk about strategy. And strategy is, you know, I always encourage artists and students before you start drawing or painting to just stop, breathe, look, and appreciate what you have, and think. Stop, breathe, look, and think. Think, okay, what do I have? What do I want to do? <laughs> what do I want to accomplish? What is the model giving me? What is the light? What is the shadow? What's interesting to me? What story do I want? You know, the whole thing I've been talking about for 10 years. Basically, it's a good idea to stop and think first, of course, what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, and what you have to work with. We're talking about realistic eyes today. And when we look at models or reference, of course, we need to see what we're given. And here we have three different scenarios. They're quite interesting. Three different, mostly frontal shots. So we will need to, quote unquote, render and finish both eyes. Okay. We need to do two eyes in this case. Now, comment below. Here's a pop quiz. Comment below. Of these three paintings, of these, let's say we're going to do realistic paintings or realistic drawings from these three models, from these three references. Which one will need more explanation and which one will need more suggestion? Comment below. The image on the left, image number one, image number two in the middle, or image number three on the right. Let's start with that. Image number one, number two, number three. Which one will need more explanation? Comment below. Do you see it? I think it's quite obvious. Of course, it's the one on the right. <laughs> Image number three of the young lady here with these two big, beautiful eyes <laughs> that are staring straight at us. We know we most likely will have to do a lot of explanation here, a lot of rendering and careful explanation here. Why? Both eyes are in light and it's front view, almost near perfect front view, orthographic front view. And both eyes are in clear flat lighting. So this is clear, uh, flattering beauty lighting that photographers do. So barely any shadows. So we can't hide the eye in shadow. So there you go. And I would argue that the eye is the prominent feature. The prominent, not only feature of the face, but the prominent feature of the image. When you look at the girl on the right, you're like, wow, big, beautiful eyes. That's the first thing I thought of. Like, oh, my God. Beautiful eyes, big, big eyes. That's the first two words that pop in my head. The most likely when you do a painting of this young lady, if this was your subject, you know, if that's your gut reaction, that would be a great place to put a lot of your attention because that will be the gut reaction of your viewer. Your viewer will be like, oh, look at that painting of those big, beautiful eyes. Now, if we go to the far left, the first image, Henry Cavill, the actor here, we can clearly see that, okay, we can see much less of the eye than the girl on the right. 
it's hidden in shadow. So we know right away, okay, here I get to do more suggestion. I don't have to explain as much. So here I can be more like Sargent or Dean Cornwell, be more of an expert and suggest. And in the middle, we can see, okay, we have some shadow. The one, the eye on the right, the model's left eye, our right, is kind of hidden a bit more in shadow. And this one is more in light. So we can go, oh, okay, so I can kind of do both here. I can kind of suggest a little bit. You know, I could do more shadow suggestion, <laughs> shadow shape. I could lose some of the eye in shadow. And here I can do more explanation here. So you see the importance of planning, thinking ahead, and strategy. Don't just dive in and go, oh, crap, Chris told me to render eyes, so I'm going to practice rendering eyes. Then you grab this Henry Cavill. You go, oh, okay, I like Henry Cavill. I like Superman. I like a Witcher or whatever. I'm going to draw Henry Cavill's eyes. And then you spend 20 hours rendering these eyes, and they look terrible. And you're like, Chris, why do my eyes look terrible? Can you help me? I go, well, you should have suggested more and put more attention somewhere else. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the importance right there. We have to kind of think ahead, know what we're given, and then know. Okay, I'm going to need to do some work here, explanation, or hey, I, I can do more. I need to do more suggestion, which is also work, but a different type of work, of course. Okay, so let's um, start a little demonstration here, working on a tone surface here, and we're going to focus on black and white and drawing today. One of my core philosophies or features is that, uh, number one, they only look good when they're placed correctly. So if they're drawn and constructed correctly, placed if the lane is correct. And they only look good if they look good relative to each other. <laughs> so if your eyes are drawn beautifully, but the nose looks terrible or is in the wrong place, your eyes are going to look much worse. I'm going to do a bit of that today, even though we're going to focus on eyes. I'm going to also, I have to give some attention to the nose and the mouth and the ear. I don't believe that anything should be drawn in isolation, not just the eye, but, but, but anything. If, if you're doing um, the back of the head, <laughs> you can even see the eyes. You can't bring one thing to a level of finish or a lot of care in one thing and ignore everything else. Hair on the whole thing, and then come back and um, refine what is needed to get the look and the um, detail needed for whatever purpose you're doing your portrait for. And I like this reference too because it's a nice example of it has an off eye or a far eye, as if. It's so a three quarters, so a far eye and near eye. And it's also a nice, um, just enough shadow on, on the face so that we could choose. So we could still make the decision here to say, oh, all right, uh, there's clearly an eye and light, but I don't have to choose the eye and light as my dominant eye. Remember, one eye has to be more finished, more dominant than the other. That's the hierarchy that we want. So it doesn't have to be the near eye. I'm just going to suggest some, just so we have some base lighting to work with. How I render eyes, I don't render, like I just, I just, <laughs> I don't, I don't render features by themselves. I don't say, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to render the eye today. No. Bring all the features together up to a certain level. So that at least they're resolved. That's, that's a, another important distinction that we need. 
future. But yeah, all the features are kind of explained. Um, well, they're, um, I'm searching for the, the right word, not quite explained and not quite um, rendered or suggested either. But everything's kind of clear enough, so you know, okay, well, it's, I'm at this stage, it, it reads that, you know, okay, you know, it, clearly the eye is not, or the nose and the mouth is not finished, the ear is not finished, it's still, this artist still working on it, I, I get it, but I, I know it's an eye, an ear, and a nose, and they're drawn in the right position and all that good stuff. A little bit more, I feel comfortable. We'll do the eye, I promise. <laughs> Just a little bit more. I, I get very nervous <laughs> if I just render the eye, but. I'm always hyper aware of the whole painting or the whole drawing or whatever, the whole piece, the whole image. Never uh, zoomed in too close to one area. Okay, here we go. So let's dive into the eye here. The first thing we need to do is take a look at what we have and then decide. We have to first decide where is my dominant eye? Well, we have to decide where's the dominant focal point thing, of course, in the whole painting. In this case, we know it's the eye. Okay, we have two eyes. We have to resolve. We have to render, explain. We have to choose one. So comment below. Which eye would you make? The dominant eye. Comment below. Which eye would you make the dominant eye? The eye that's on the right or the eye that's on the left? The eye that's closest to us, the near eye or the far eye? Which eye would you make the dominant eye? Because believe it or not, there's no right or wrong answer. You can make the far eye the dominant eye. You can. You saw what Sargent did. All he did was just put one or two strokes to make the far eye, the shadow eye, come forward and look really good. He could have did much more, and you as well. So there's no right or wrong answer. Whatever you decide is valid, can work, but you have to decide. <laughs> That's why I wanted to remind you to stop and think first. Okay, what, what am I doing? What am I doing here? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring, just like we saw me do with the face, I'm going to bring both eyes up a nice level until one clearly needs to be focused on. And I start with value. So establishing the value range, because what will make the finish, I feel finished, is contrast, level of detail. Related to contrast. A lot of care right here, a lot of subtlety here. So he's still a young man. I make that piece of anatomy, that little piece of detail. If I make it too harsh or too sharp, it'll age him too much. We don't, we, we don't want that. Of course, we want it to look 
like our subject and of course we got to get the age right and that starting to look way too dark in there So again, it's more things to be aware of. You can see I need to move this cheekbone shape. You see, I'm trying to render the eye, but the drawing of the cheekbone and actually the brow bone is not where I want it to be. So that is really bothering me right now. I almost need to stop and draw the eye structures, the brow bone and the cheekbone, basically, the eye so what's around the eye socket. It is not helping me at all. It looks awful in my opinion. <laughs> I'm looking at it and go, oh my God, just drawn poorly. I'm trying to teach how to render the eye, but I'm looking at my own drawing. Oh my God, that is drawn so poorly. I cannot live with myself. <laughs> I can't live with myself. I got, it's just bothering the hell out of me <laughs> so badly. I, go, ah, I got to do something about it. It's like ha having an itch, you know, <laughs> an itch you can't reach. I'm like, jeez, I just want to scratch. <laughs> this is awful. more clarity as to okay that helped a lot there might be a lot more clarity as to where i am i don't know where i am on this cheek that's really bothering me and this line is too hard now beautiful mark but it's just too hard for what i need i need much more subtlety here i have to kind of redraw this whole thing with an airbrush now. A la prima master like sergeant there. I'm resisting the temptation to add a highlight because he is very fair skinned and the paper is darker than his skin. Not by much, but it, it is slightly darker than the skin, so we do need to add highlights to make the values work and, of course, the, the likeness. <laughs> he'll look like he's being portrait and this is someone you know, or something. He'll look, he'll look like he just came back from the beach or something. I'm going to the mouth here. Desperately want more information because right now I just <laughs> I just don't uh, feel comfortable <laughs> working like this unless everything all the features are not working uh, obviously and I can see lots of drawing errors so it's bothering the hell out of me. But I'm also holding true to what I mentioned earlier is that uh, we don't know anything in isolation including the eyes, of course. Okay, so we have a nice base here. What I'm going to do now is punch in the darkest dark and the lightest light. So even though we're focusing on the eyes, I still need to see the value range that we're going to use. So here we go. Let's just punch in a dark. And it's up to you, sort of. Oh, it is up to you. I mean, but it's also, you know, what the painting gives you. If you have a fair skin model with bright lighting, and let's say the lighting is also cool in temperature, you're going to make them look very, very light skinned in value, especially. I 
And if the eye, like that earlier example that we saw of the young woman with the, um, with the flat frontal lighting, If your lighting is more flattering, not a lot of shadow, you're going to need to put obviously more, more work there as well. Well, you still have strong value contrast. You still have the darks, but uh, lights will dominate the scene so actually you know in a way i'm almost done actually i'm almost done because number one drawing is very good you know i don't mean to sound arrogant but it's, it's correct it was drawn well and what i mean is placement size shape position the eyes are placed correctly the nose and the mouth is placed correctly, and they're placed correctly relative to each other, so perfect placement. So all three of them are making each other look good and look finished, quote unquote finished, look complete, look whole, look believable, read. That's really helping. And also my uh, value structure is quite good. So that's quite clear as well, and also the the shapes are very, very clear. Like this lid is clearly turning away from us, so it's super clear. This eyelids, oh, it's clearly tear duct there. Oh, okay, so that the eye is going into space there, going into space here. So very clearly drawn. Everything feels believable. You can read. And what I want to do is, um, again, bring both eyes to a nice level, and then we'll pick one. I already know which one. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. 